ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. What are some of the keys to dealing with generational transfer of ranching assets? We'll have some special insight. And now, a special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to a special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. As we visit with ranching families around the country, one common theme we hear is the desire to leave a legacy and to pass the ranch on to another generation. But these days, with land values and cattle values where they are, and with estate taxes and many other issues to consider, the generational transfer of ranching assets is often a challenge. And it's a challenge many families tend to put off until they're forced to deal with it. So today, we're going to share some insights on this issue, and in particular, we'll bring you the story of the R.A. Brown Ranch in Texas, and hear from the Brown family about how they dealt with the issue of generational transfer. First, let's begin with some comments from producers about some of their concerns and the issues they see in passing the ranch on to the next generation. Generational transfer is not easy. It's not. And, and so what concerns me the most is that it gets hard and it gets emotional and it gets, and it gets really tough really quick and then you stop. And that's what concerns me is that you got to keep going through it. Um, Troy and I recently been through it with his family and we many times were with the lawyer and the accountant and all, all the family in the same room and I just thought, wow, we're getting along through this process. I can't imagine if you're not getting along how much harder it is for people to go through the process. And so there are, there are multiple ways that people get bogged down and just quit. And that to me is the scariest part. You can't quit. You have to muddle through it and it's hard and it's emotional and it's, it's brutal. But you got to keep working through it because if we don't get things in place for the next generation to be able to smoothly run um, in when you're no longer here. We're going to lose a lot of opportunities in agriculture. Having just gone through that process, um, I think one of the hardest things that we were dealing with as we went through was all the uncertainty that comes out of Washington, D.C. You're trying to make plans based on what the tax laws are, based on what the regulations are. And those regulations and tax codes are such a moving target that it made it really difficult to make those plans. Obviously, uh, this is a put together place. We've bought it and we bought this with money that we've already paid taxes on. So, and it will be left to my son. So, I have very strong feelings about the death tax. Uh, we think that we've already paid taxes on that money that we bought this place with. And so we should be able to transfer that ownership to him without a death tax. And uh, we feel very strongly about that. These places should not be chopped up. All the management that's gone into them, all the care that's gone into them should not be fragmented. And fragmentation is a very big problem in Texas. We have a thousand new people a day moving to the state. And obviously we could sell this place and um, be pretty well off and um, not have to worry about a lot of things, but that's not our desire and we would like to leave it to our son and we should be able to do that without being penalized. Of course, one of the big challenges families face as they think about the future of their ranch is answering the question, what will the beef industry be like in the future and what kind of structure do we need to have a profit-making business? We get some insight on that topic as Brian Baxter reports. No doubt beef cattle prices are strong today, but what are the business challenges and opportunities as the beef industry looks ahead to 2025? Dr. Bill Meese provided some insight at the International Livestock Congress in Denver. What I saw was is that in the cow-calf area, we would expand, in the short run at least, in the next couple of years, uh, because economics are there. Uh, everything's kind of lined up for more cows than what we had before. There are some things that will retard that. There are some things that will prevent it from being a runaway, like the availability of land and the cost of land and government regulation and so on. 
all of those things and the age of the ranchers who are running operations today, all of that will tend to hold it in check. But I, I forecast that by 2025, we would have about the same number of cows that we had today. And that may not be treated as good news until you consider that we've been going down in cow numbers since 1976. And if we can stabilize them and hold them steady for the next 10 or 11 years, that's a giant win for the cattle industry. Dr. Meese says high prices at the retail level could ultimately reduce consumer demand for beef. He also says the U.S. packing industry has been closing plants, slowly bringing capacity in line with the supply of cattle. While the economics for cow-calf producers do look strong over the next several years, he says expansion is not a given for all producers. The age of cattlemen and, and farmers, and people in agriculture in general, has always concern me. If you look at Midwestern farmers, we're looking at a 59 to 60 year average age. You're looking at ranchers, we're looking maybe five or six or seven years more than that. And when you look at the things that we've done in this country to have nicer, more luxurious, work easing kinds of lives, if you're 70 years old as I am, and somebody says, you know, you could run 25% more cows out there and make 25% more hay and process 25% more calves. And I'd say, do I really want to do that? And I'd have to think a long time before that answer would turn out to be yes. And so I think that's another one of those issues that while the economic signals may be there, it may, and it'll be an individual decision on people's part, but it, it will slow that down. It won't be an automatic yes that I would try to do that. People will think their way through whether they really want to work that much harder than they're currently working today. And for younger people working to get started in the cattle business, Dr. Meese says the barriers to entry now and in the future will require some creative business structures. What I have spent a lot of time teaching students at Texas A&M is that if you're going to get started in ranching or in the stocker cattle business, you need to familiarize yourself with the concept of leasing and you will lease until you're old enough to own because that's your only real entree into this business. Uh, in order to get the loans that you're going to need, uh, you're going to have to tie up some grass and be able to show a banker that I've got this much country and I can put this many cattle on it and manage them in this way. and. Uh, then someday you'll go into him and say, well, I bought some property and now I want to I want to finance that with you as well. Uh, that's the way the young people will have to deal with this business. The price of land today is just beyond reason for a young person starting out. Dr. Meese also believes that while the U.S. will remain a strong beef exporter in the years ahead, producers will also be competing with a rising tide of beef imports into the U.S. market leading up to 2025. I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Still ahead on this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We just feel like the death tax is a, is a very un unfair tax. I've worked all my lifetime to buy my sister out and, and grow this ranch and, and uh, to give it up for taxes is, is not what's been my plan and, and that's why we made the decision to divide it to the four children at this time. We'll sit down with members of the R.A. Brown Ranch to hear how they handled the challenge of passing the ranch to another generation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD-TV. You may not be thinking about spring yet, but we are. And that means it's time for the John Deere Green Fever Sales Event. Get ready for the season early with the hottest deals on compact and utility tractors, hay tools, even John Deere gators and turf equipment. Get 0% financing, cash back, and implement bonuses so you'll be ready when warm weather returns and enter to win a $25,000 landscape makeover, plus John Deere equipment at johndeere.com slash green fever. I'm Sheila Carges. Um, this is my husband, Brock. We have two girls, Karina and Jessica. Both girls can pull cattle, doctor, process anything that we need them to do. Using products that help keep the calves healthy, it helps my parents to be less stressful. 
helps them to be at home more and it helps pay more bills when you don't have to worry about sick cattle. I'd say 98, 99% of our cattle are high risk. We've never seen a response due to a metaphylaxis like we have with the Draxon. I think Draxon has a major role in any operation as far as your viability and your long-term outlook. And how do you quantify having a peace of mind to take a vacation for a week or leave work early to go watch a basketball game? You can't quantify that. Important safety information for Draxon. Draxon has a pre-slaughter withdrawal time of 18 days. Do not use in dairy cattle 20 months of age or older. Effects on reproductive performance, pregnancy, and lactation have not been determined. Hello, I'm Kevin Ochsner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Each week, we travel the country to bring you the latest cattle industry news and information. Check us out at cattlemantocattlemen.org or on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back. Many ranching families are dealing with the issue of generational transfer. When to do it, how to do it, and how to keep peace in the family while you do it. We're here today in Throckmorton, Texas at the R.A. Brown Ranch visiting with the Brown family about their decision to transfer the ranch and with me now is Rob Brown. Rob, thanks so much for agreeing to come on our show. Well, it's proud to have you here. We uh, wanted to start, just uh, give people a bit of a perspective about the history of this ranch. Five generations, is that right? That's right. We uh, actually uh, moved from Virginia after the Civil War. My, my great-grandfather was in the uh, Black Horse Cavalry under Zeb Stewart, and, and uh, they lost everything in, in Virginia and came to Texas and started over. And uh, uh, we've been in the cattle business since the late 1800s and uh, we love the business and, and it's passed down from family to family and we've been fortunate most of the time we've grown it a little is in each one's lifetime but it's a it's a chore to do today in, in the, the tax world that we're in to uh, got to make some decisions at some point. Rob five generations over a hundred years of ranching tradition what events or circumstances led you to make this decision now? We just feel like the death tax is a, is a very un, unfair tax. I've worked all my lifetime to buy my sister out and, and grow this ranch, and, and uh, to give it up for taxes is, is not what's in my plan, and, and that's why we made the decision to divide it to the four children at this time. Some families in your position don't have any kids that want to come back to the ranch. In your case, you had four children that wanted to be involved in production agriculture. Did you find that a benefit or a challenge? Yes, uh, actually, uh, they, they've grown some ranches of their own and, and they've bought some land and know how to ranch and they're very capable and, and not everybody's, I'm sure, got that circumstance. Not all of them like the seed stock end of it. Most of them like commercial cows and stalker and uh, more and of course we built this ranch around the seed stock end of it. So tell us this, what was the children's reaction uh, when uh, you came to them and said it's time to make a transfer? Well I think they were were pleased. Uh, uh, we let them do most of the work and uh, they really worked well with one another to, to pacify the needs of, of uh, and desires of each one that are that are different and and when it came to the cattle uh, Donald was the only one that really wanted to stay in the seed stock business so we decided a dispersal sale was the best way to, to divide the cattle. Uh, and, and tell us this as uh, you mentioned the kids took a real leadership role give us more about the process of how you went through the mechanics of deciding who got what or, or what assignment did you give your children? Well uh, we had them to make the decision that they wanted to do it, wanted to work together, and, and, and they did. And they sat down and, and divided it up in, in increments that, that best fit. Uh, Jody, my son-in-law, uh, was the only farmer in the bunch. So he, he got the majority of the, of the uh, farmland. And, and Donald, 
needed the facilities, the feedlot and all here at the headquarters to, to do a, a seed stock operation. And, and uh, they, they really worked together to give one another the needs that, that they prefer. As you and Peggy uh, approached this process, uh, what were you most afraid of? Well, uh, we were very fortunate. I mean, we, had, we, we don't know how long our lifespans are going to be, and, and uh, we were very fortunate to be in a position with some uh, other economic income that, uh, that we felt was satisfactory for, for us. And, and uh, uh, tax-wise, uh, we just felt like it was a, a time to make the move, and, and the kids were trained and ready, and, and uh, so it's, it's worked well for us. Is there any part of the process that you look back on and say, that was a critical success factor, or this is something I would absolutely recommend to other people, a decision or an action that you took to make the process uh, go smoother? Well, I, I think the dispersal sale, as far as the cattle was, uh, in, in our circumstance where they had a very recognizable seed stock program going, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that worked. It's a lot easier to divide those dollars than it was to divide those cows, and, and uh, so it's, it's worked very well for us. So Rob, tell us this, is there anything you would have done differently looking back on the situation? Well, uh, history will, I guess, answer that for us, but uh, we think it was a good move and it's gone well and, and we're very happy and satisfied. So Rob, fast forward 10 years from now, uh, how will you know that this decision has been a success at that point? Well, we hope Peg and I are still healthy and, and uh, alive and, and enjoying our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and and uh, be fun to watch them uh, grow up uh, under ranching circumstances like our children did. And uh, we've always said it's not the most lucrative uh, occupation there is, but uh, it's sure the right place to raise kids and cattle and quarter horses. And, and uh, we think growing up on a ranch is really important and a lot of love in the family and, and working together. And, and I, I think it's a great choice. And you've done a good job raising all three of those things, I might add. Well, one other question. Um, actually, as you think about other families who are wrestling with the same issue uh, that, that you wrestled with, uh, what would you tell them? What advice would you give them? Well, I, I think they've got to do what fits their family, but uh, passing this on tax-wise, we think is real important. Uh, my father passed away when he was 62 and, and hadn't done much tax planning and and I had to pay enough tax to almost buy the ranch again and uh, I just don't think that's a, a fair situation and and we uh, we think the kids can run it and a lot of love in the family and it'll work. As we wrap up the interview today uh, you had made a comment once that uh, as you make this decision you're making this decision in order to keep the ranch in the family and the family in the ranch. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I think just what it says. Uh, we we want the kids to carry on in the, the ranching industry, and, and uh, we're leaving them enough to, to get a start, and, and, and I think they could grow it, and, and with the love and talent that they have, uh, I think we'll be in the ranching business for generations to come. I would agree. Rob, thanks for your time, and thanks for all your sage wisdom today. We appreciate it. Well, thank you very kindly. And we'll be back right after this. New Holland is the undisputed leader in hay tools. We give farmers a wide range of innovative equipment that increases efficiency and productivity all year round. Because to us, smart means providing a smooth, clean cut with faster dry down, plug free conditioning and superior bale density. And smart means leaving less hay on the field to feed more livestock in less time. That's New Holland Smart. Visit your local New Holland dealer today. Join your fellow cattlemen in sizzling hot San Antonio for the 2015 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the beef industry's biggest convention, and it's great for education, networking, and fun. Plus, you can check out the NCBA Trade Show for the latest technology. It's the 2015 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show in sizzling hot San Antonio, Texas, February 4 through 7. Visit BeefUSA.org for more.
Welcome back. We're continuing our segment on generational transfer here at the R.A. Brown Ranch. And with me now is Donald Brown. Donald, thanks for spending a few minutes with us today. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I, the first question I have for you is, what was your immediate reaction after working all your life alongside all your brothers and sisters and family when mom and dad came and said, hey, it's time to split up the ranch? It was a surprise to me. You know, we had done some financial planning years ago with some of the land, but as far as dividing it out to the four kids, uh, I was a bit surprised. So when your folks came to you and gave you the assignment to uh, devise a plan for splitting up the ranch, how did you and your siblings approach that? Well, it was interesting. You know, Dad, Dad said, all right, we're going to divide up the ranch, and, you know, you're more involved in the seed stock, so I think you'll get that, and Jody's more involved in the farm, and I think we'll give him that. And Mom said, no, no, wait just a minute. We're giving this to them. Let's let them decide. And so I thought it was great wisdom on mom's behalf, and it worked out well. Now, you know, it was a bit... Challenging. Is, yeah, you know, to sit together and divide up a ranch that's been in the family now five generations. Yeah. But it was amazing, and it worked well, and we divided it up, and that, the, dividing the land was actually the easiest part. So as you and your siblings began that process, was it just you and your siblings involved, or did you involve the entire family? Mom and Dad just wanted the four of us kids in there to, to divide up the land. And so that's the way we did it. And, you know, we, uh, we met several times. We started each meeting with a prayer, and we analyzed the situation. And we didn't make it hastily. We would meet. We would wait. We would uh, sleep on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And uh, it all worked out very, very well. Donald, tell us this. What were some of the challenges as you and your siblings walked through this process? Well, you know, anytime you start talking about the end of someone's life and passing it on, it's not a comfortable discussion. Uh, but mom and, dad, mom and dad started that conversation, which made it a whole lot easier for us. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, mom and dad are in excellent health. And, you know, they just said, we want to pass this on now while we can enjoy each of you enjoy and pursue your dreams mm -hmm. with your families and use your gifts and talents and interests. And so, we're, you know, we're, we're blessed by that. I don't know what it's like to lose a parent. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't imagine going through this process of dividing up the family business along with the emotional drain of a loss of a loved one. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's challenging, but I think it's so much easier to do it without that... Extra burden. Absolutely, without that burden and being able to do it uh, with clear mind and mom and dad right there in case we need them to ask a question <laughs> to referee that's right so <laughs> you know right. i think it's important um one of the things that you know mom has always instilled in us in love and and that was very important as we went through this process you know i, I can i can still remember as a child two things one mom teaching us about first corinthians chapter 13 mm -hmm. and that ver that ends with and the there these three things remain but the greatest of these Faith, hope, and love. But you're right. The greatest of these is love. Absolutely. And the other thing I was remembering just this morning as I pulled out of the ranch entrance and onto the highway is I remember all four of us kids in the vehicle on Sunday mornings headed to town. Mm -hmm. And every time when we would turn by the ranch sign, Dad would look around and he'd say, I sure love my family. Mm -hmm. And those, those, those words just echo in my mind. And so they taught that to us from an early age. Mm -hmm. And I think that helped us in this process of dividing it up and keeping peace in the family because that was higher priority than who gets this or who gets that. I think my brother, Rob A., had some really good wisdom. He said, you know, if, if any of us get exactly what we, what we want, mm -hmm. it's probably not fair. Donald, looking back on the process, uh, is there anything you'd do differently? Looking back, I, I, I can't think of anything I would do differently. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, for us, it just worked out great. Uh, we weren't rushed. Mom and Dad kind of gave us the you know gave us their plans that they were ready to start doing the process. But it wasn't a rushed situation. We were able to meet, even though not all of us live right here on the ranch. We would meet once a month and and you know discuss how we're going to divide this thing up, what we'll do with the land, what to do with the cattle, what to do with the minerals, all of those different things, and it worked out very well. I, I don't think I I don't think I'd change a thing. 
Well, Donald, this is the Cattleman and Cattlemen Show, so I'd like to ask you a little bit about dividing the cattle. We discussed how you approached uh, the, the, the land division, but uh, dividing a set of uh, registered seed stock that you've spent generations building is an emotional decision. Tell us about that. We did the, the land first, and that was easy. The cattle, I, I've been back here on the ranch for 20-something years, working side by side with Dad on the seed stock side. And that's my passion, that's Kelly and I's passion, is seed stock. My older siblings, my two sisters and my brother, are love, they, they love commercial cattle, they love stalker cattle, and they're good at it. That's their passion, that's what they want to do. Seed stock's not really their, their interest. And so as we looked at doing the cattle, what are we going to do? We could divide them up four ways. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be hard with four different breeds and not equal numbers of breeds and different values of the cattle. How do we divide them up? Since my siblings were more interested in commercial cattle, we talked about it and decided, one, mom and dad have poured their whole life into the seed stock program. We've been raising seed stock cattle since the 1890s. Why don't we let their life legacy live on through these cows as registered seed stock to the industry and be a blessing to the industry? And with that, help the cattle bring great value for what their seed stock value would be worth. And then if some of the family wants to buy a few out of the sale, that's fine. And we were very transparent by that. And then, so our hope was the cattle would live on, the industry live on uh, with those cattle. Mom and dad's legacy live on through the cattle. And that our siblings would probably have more money in their pockets to buy commercial cattle to stock their part of the ranch. And it worked out very well. Tell us about some of the changes and some of the challenges from transitioning from a large multi-family operation to individual operators of your own ranch. There are a lot of things that I hadn't done here on the ranch. My sister Betsy had always done the accounting. And so now Kelly and I are like, oh my goodness, there's a lot we have to learn. <laughs> and, and, and so that was, that was one of the challenging things in that transition is, you know, we're, we're downsizing, we don't have as many cattle, we don't have as, but, and yet here and I, Kelly and I, we're still gonna sell 600 bulls each October. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that with the help of our cooperator team mm -hmm. and because mom and dad gave us enough lead time mm -hmm. to do some planning where we could buy some commercial cows, mm -hmm. put embryos from our best donor cows and rebuild the cow herd. Sure. And so it, it's, it's worked out very well. So what are your plans for the future? Well, Kelly and I, we, we want to continue to be right here on the ranch in the house where we all grew up on our, at our headquarters, keep having bull sales every fall. And, uh, well, I, I think as someone coined years ago, we want to keep raising cows, kids, and quarter horses. Not looking forward uh, 10 years from now, how will you gauge the success of the decisions you've made? 10 years from now, success to me will be defined if all our families are still doing what we love to do, and we still have peace in the family, and we are a family. That to me is success. Thank you, Donald, for all your candor and your insight. I appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll be back right after this. Well, I think a rancher has to be a steward of the land. There's nobody else that can take care of land better than a rancher can because he has to make his living off of it. When we switched over to the uh, Perina products, it was uh, a step in the right direction and uh, it's it's really been profitable for us it just makes that much of a difference the difference we see in the cattle is the consistency of their nutrition they don't go up and down drastically in weight every head on this ranch is fed the uh, Purina Superlix 30 if we keep it keep them on that feed they stay in optimum condition year-round the cattle hold their condition a lot better all through throughout the whole year the products they're producing are um, very much in line with what the rancher needs to be using to uh, be profitable in the future. That's the best thing ever happened to us. It does make a difference that we can see, day in and day out. We don't sit idle, wondering how we're gonna build a better truck. We get out there and walk a mile thousands of miles in the footsteps of the guys we build trucks for. The groundbreaking Ram Heavy Duty with 30,000 pounds of towing and 850 pound feet of torque. 
Got a friend or family member with a case of classic tractor fever? You can help by ordering them the classic tractor fever farm deal. This special set includes both the 2015 Classic Farm Tractors calendar and the companion DVD, Uncommon Classics. It's our biggest and best lineup of tractors ever. That's hours of enjoyment on the wall and on the TV. Just call 1-800-888-8979 or visit the website, ClassicTractors.com. We're here at the R.A. Brown Ranch discussing the issue of generational transfer. And with me now is the third child in the Brown family, Marianne McCartney. Marianne, what was your initial reaction when your folks came to you and said, it's time to split up the ranch? A uh, great surprise. Uh, you know, I really never expected that to take place prior to someone's passing on. Uh, I realized that it, uh, through some great planning and preparation, maybe even um, more than my parents, but the example that they had generations before them. There's just been beautiful uh, generosity mm -hmm. and uh, giving of, in order to keep the operation in the family over many, many years. So um, I'm humbled. I'm excited. Uh, our family's looking forward to uh, seeing what we can do. And uh, keeping things intact. I know my father learned from his own experience when his father passed away and the death tax and so forth and uh, it, it taught them a great deal and they're able to learn from that and now share in this beautiful way this great opportunity with us kids. Marianne, what lessons did you and your brothers and sisters learn about keeping peace in the family throughout this whole process? Oh, I'd have to say great uh, patience and deep love for one another. Um, I, I do feel it was advantageous that we started early in the process as far as when our, our goal was to meet the uh, completion of the process, that it took a great number of meetings and the meetings always seemed to take a, more time than we expected going over the details of uh, sorting things out and deciding what was fair and, and so forth. So giving it plenty of time, mm -hmm. uh, not being in a rush to get through the process and um, just having deep admiration for one another and a lot of prayer uh, over the process helped things go smoothly. So what do your kids think about this new adventure uh, that you're beginning in your own operation? Oh, the kids are excited. Um, our children we, we try real hard to teach a, a work ethic in this day and age, and uh, I would have to say that's become a little bit easier. Now they feel some ownership uh, when it's time to fix fence or um, gather and work cattle. They, they feel that, you know, this benefits them, and, you know, someday this piece of ground may be part of theirs, so you don't have to twist their arm as hard. And, mm -hmm. It's, it's beautiful to work together as family, and I still feel I've grown up with that, and I feel it's still very much the same, and, and I hope that we can do the same for our children someday. We're blessed to have this opportunity. And that's one last question. So what are your hopes for the future uh, in your own operation? Oh, I would say uh, Todd and I have a, uh, a lot of learning to do. We're kind of new in this a stage of production and uh, as our youngest goes off to school in the fall I'll be his uh, assistant more and uh, our children are getting older and can participate in the after school and weekend part of the operations. Thank you so much for your insights and your candor we appreciate it and we'll be back right after this. There's something wrong. His head is down. He's clearly stressed. He's worried sick about BRD. That's why there's prescription Zactran for BRD treatment and control in high-risk cattle. Get a rapid response plus 10-day treatment and control in a single dose so you can stop worrying and get back to business. For use in cattle only, do not treat cattle within 35 days of slaughter. 
because a discard time in milk has not been established. Do not use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older or in calves to be processed for veal. The effects of Zactran on bovine reproductive performance, pregnancy, and lactation have not been determined. Don't worry yourself sick. Talk to your veterinarian about a real alternative for BRD treatment and control. Because it's critical, it's Zactran. From Marielle, a leading animal health company. We're continuing our discussion on generational transfer here at the R.A. Brown Ranch, and with me now is the matriarch of the family, Peggy Brown. Peggy, you've raised a great family, great kids, grandkids, and now I guess some great grandkids. What are you most proud of in terms of your family? Oh, I'd say probably how close we all are. We're very blessed with a lot of love between the siblings and the grandchildren and now the little bitty ones. Peggy, I understand you had some real strong convictions in having the kids take a leadership role in deciding how to split the ranch and the assets as opposed to you and Rob making that decision. Tell us more about that. Well, I just felt it probably should be their decision to make choices as to what would fit their operation best, and they were going to have to live with it, and I, I just felt like they needed to work that out. How do you handle uh, the situation when you have four kids that each have an interest in production agriculture, but they have different interests? They're not all the same. How do you address that in uh, splitting up uh, a ranch? Well, that, that, was, uh, that was the reason we had the dispersal, was because uh, Donald and Kelly were the only ones who really preferred the seed stock business. So the others were cow-calf and stocker and farming. So uh, that created a problem about how to divide that successfully. And that's how we arrived at that decision. So what do you think is key to maintaining good family relationships throughout this process? We let them have their discussions. They invited us, but we chose to let them. And I, I assume it went well. That was my request. There, no, there not be any disagreements any unhappiness. Not, so far as I know, there wasn't. So tell me this, as you think about the four families beginning their own individual operations, uh, what's your hope for the future? Well, I don't mind being the age I am, but I'm shocked at how my children are. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's kind of nice that they can live their dreams now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's time. That's very good. Thank you so much for giving us some time. You're welcome. It's good to see you, Kevin. It's, it's always good to see you. You're dear friends of ours. Yep. And we'll be back right after this. Whether you're feeding cattle, milking cows, or baling hay, the work on your farm is never done, which is why you need equipment that works as hard as you do. Get the efficiency and versatility you need with Case IH. From farm all compact and utility tractors to balers and mowers. All Case IH equipment is designed with one thing in mind, getting the job done. To learn more, visit caseih.com slash livestock. It's the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattlemen is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattleman. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org and join today. Your herd, your business, your family. You've always protected what matters most so you know how important vaccinations are for healthy cattle. And with Vista vaccines from Merck Animal Health, you know you're covered. No other vaccine works like Vista. Only Vista gives you complete dual action pneumonia protection and complete one dose fetal protection for the entire pregnancy. Protect what matters most. Talk to your veterinarian or animal health supplier about Vista. Welcome back. 
Today, we're focusing on the issue of transferring the ranch from one generation to the next. Of course, the first step is having another generation that is interested in coming back to be a part of the ranch and having enough of a business for everyone to make a living. We traveled to Wyoming to see firsthand how one family managed that, as Russell Nemitz reports. In southeastern Wyoming, just outside of Cheyenne, the Isley family owns and operates the King Ranch Company. Their diversified operation includes cow-calf, stalker cattle, custom hain, as well as a custom machinery business. The combination of multiple income sources allows the family operation to support two generations full-time back on the ranch. I couldn't be happier. This is a parent's dream. Uh, when you get along with the family, you can keep them close. Family operations are always a challenge because there's you raise strong, independent-minded family, and you expect them, and then you kind of want them to fall in line. Doesn't work that way. But uh, fortunately, we, we communicate wonderfully. Each of the family uh, holds stock. They're all uh, uh, holders in the ranch, and all have a working interest. Two of my three adult children live here on the ranch and work with me, as does my wife. I think what is unique uh, for our operation is how all three of us siblings have kind of gotten into something different, uh, that we weren't discouraged to try something different. I love the cow-calf operation, my brother does the uh, yearling and the backgrounding operation, and then my sister uh, is kind of the in-between. She loves both and she still comes back and helps with whatever she, she can and possibly do. So I think that that's encouraging to know that we all can uh, still have an individual area that we can be proficient in as well as help each other out. Parents have to be both mentors and partners. They have to figure out what the individual needs of that particular uh, family member might be. Some of them have an interest in machinery and maybe they want to take over the farming or, the, or those cropping operations. Other ones might have talents or, or intuition on livestock and maybe that's where their, their uh, emphasis should be placed. Getting a good education is paramount. I think uh, getting a background is, is important so you can relate. And find out what some folks are doing. Sometimes other folks have uh, already invented the wheel. You don't need to try to do it again by yourself. Well, I kind of joke about my education just a little bit because I went to school for six years and got a bachelor's and master's in agriculture business and agriculture economics, and then I come home to ranch. But I, I like to tell people that I did go to school exactly for what I wanted to do, and that was learning how to increase the operation, get a more efficient operation, and uh, just make it a better opportunity for myself and my siblings, and making sure that my parents have a smooth transition to all three of us when, when they're ready to retire. The ranch's diversity allows each family member to focus on their passion, but also provides a chance to try new things. The Isley family members all agree that this freedom to expand creates ownership and satisfaction among each other. We have a lot of things happening around us. We have uh, the city owns property, there's an oil field next to us, the wind farm is on our out extreme border, and anytime we have the opportunity to do machine work for those people, we will. Uh, we'll excavate. We'll do water lines, pipelines, build a road, uh, maybe even roustabout work if necessary, snow removal. We also do custom haying, and some of that we sell, some of it we do on a crop share basis. That adds to our ability to purchase newer, nicer machinery and not carry it all on the weight of the livestock. It makes it uh, more comfortable and more fun for the family members who are involved in the operation. I like the diversity, I like the different things this place has been able to do because yeah, if, if maybe feeding cows isn't your thing or doctoring or playing vet and, and taking care of the sick animals isn't really your thing, you know, you can work on machinery or you can work on uh, farming. They do the construction business now, you know, I have some interest in that, so I, I like that aspect of it and if other operations can maybe learn from that and diversify a little bit and maybe they'll find their niche, there's something they really like and just even going down into a niche specifically. Maybe the ranch that you work at or your operation isn't working anymore. There's other things you can pursue, other things you can look into. The Isley family members all recognize that diversification is crucial to the success of their operation. Mark attributes his early success as a young producer to finding a specialty market, and he encourages young producers today to do the same. I think there's some great opportunities for young people. Uh, as we're watching uh, operators continue to get older and older in this country. There are some opportunities for young people to step in. They have to be creative. They have to think outside of the box, if you'll excuse the cliche. Look for enterprises that might fit. 
uh, niche markets that might fit. That's how I got my start with was niche markets. No one did custom hay work in, in our part of the country, but it worked for me to get into the cattle business. We get to think outside the box here. If something doesn't work, we get to try something new and different. And maybe just the, the freedom of it is, is, it's cool. It's different, it's unique. Family members working together for a bigger, bigger thing than themselves. This operation has taught me that you can survive and you can adapt even with changes in the world. Uh, you can always expand it and make it better, make it easier. You don't have to always work harder. You can always work smarter. And that's what I think is important about this place. It's kind of taught some life lessons and you still get to work with the family. Reporting from Wyoming, I'm Russell Nimitz for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Why not join the Isley family as members of NCBA? It's easy to do, and there are some outstanding member privileges and discounts. To find out more, visit the website beefusa.org. We'll visit with our good friend Baxter Black right after this. Stay with us. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. That's right, where it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real and feeding my family a home-cooked meal that's important to me. That's important to me and Planting the garden and watching it grow I'm an NCBA member because NCBA, they look at the facts, they look at the history, and they look what's good for the industry. It's important to be NCBA members just because of what NCBA does. They keep us informed about a lot of things that are going on nationwide. The reason we're an NCBA member is we think that it's the best voice that the cattle people have. Join NCBA today. Head to BeefUSA.org or call 866-USA-BEEF. Working your cattle just got easier. Introducing the new Vet Gun Delivery System, a new way to apply topical insecticides to your cattle. The Vet Gun lets you remotely treat cattle with effective parasite control, so you can do it from an ATV, on horseback, or just walking among the herd. It's that simple. The proven topical insecticide AML Vet Cap is used with the Vet Gun. It works fast to control horn flies and lice while minimizing stress on your cattle. Fast, easy, effective. Vet Gun. Check with your animal health supplier for availability. We know who made that hitch. We know who cut the steel, who milled the ball, and who welded the seams. We know who tested, measured, and checked. We even know who thought the whole thing up. We're B&W, and we know your hitch. Because we don't make them halfway around the world. We make them all right here. B&W. Trusted. With the advent of cowboy poetry has come a leap in the wearing of large mustaches not seen since the administration of Chester A. Arthur. To comply with the International Bureau of Grooming and Fastidiousness in regards to public display of facial hair defined as, though not limited to, mustache, cookie duster, pencil thin, handlebar, caterpillar, Cow catcher, lip brush, broom, nose tickler, Copenhagen reservoir, moth attractor, and a birdhouse for the migrating house fly. A copy of this regulation should be prominently displayed over the sink in Spanish and English, though not Japanese since they are mustache deprived. In establishments where food is being served, animals are allowed to run free or surgery is being performed. Number one. The owner and operator of said mustache shall confine him or herself to long foods, i.e. hot dogs, spaghetti, eels, or breadsticks. Wide foods such as watermelon, barbecued ribs, or corn on the cob is prohibited because you have to roll it backwards and it gets up your nose all the time. Number two. 
width of ornate handlebars shall not be wider than state-regulated handicap door width. Number three, use of hallucinogenic drugs, garlic or catfish bait as adhesive or stiffening agents are disallowed. Number four, renting of space to lint collectors, real estate agents or mascara testing shall be prohibited. Number five, excessive fondling of facial hair is discouraged to reduce vanity, preening disease and dandruff dissemination. Number six, self-inflicted wounds from putting on your t-shirt or biting the end of your nose or blindness and abrasions from flyaway lip hair are not covered by company insurance. Nor is facial nerve paralysis from biting the overhanging hair while dining. Remember, always wear your mustache responsibly. Treat it as a loaded weapon because even on the lip of an experienced practitioner, it can go off accidentally. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. It's time now for this week's legacy photos submitted by ranching families from around the country. Let's take a look. You can send us pictures of your farm or ranch by visiting our website, cattleman cattleman.org. Include your ranch or farm name and your hometown, and we may use them on a future episode. Well, that's our time for this special edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.